it's Cinnamon Coney or Art Sherpa, and in about an hour, I'm going to show you how to paint this adorable happy chickadee. This little fluffy, cute, adorable happy chickadee on an apple branch. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's a real direct lesson. I'm going to show you all the steps. I'm going to talk about everything I'm doing so you can do it at home. It is a no-draw lesson, which means I do have a traceable on Pinterest. You can find links to the finished painting, the traceables, the materials, everything you need to know in the description below. If you're new here and you like free awesome art lessons like that be sure and hit the subscribe button so you can be notified when we're doing a live event and if you're looking for the live chickadee check the i card lives are really fun if you've never been i wholly recommend that you go but for right now grab your paint grab your brushes grab your materials and come back and meet me at this easel right now we are gonna paint this adorable chickadee together it'll be fun come on Well, this is wonderful and I'm so glad you decided to do this painting with me. Let's take a quick look at the materials we'll be using and how we'll be beginning. Over here, I have my palette. This is a type of palette paper that you can get anywhere and it's got a coating that prevents the paint from sinking through, but you know, a polystyrene plate works too. I have the color yellow ochre. I have burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, titanium white, Mars black, cad red medium, cad yellow medium, and to help me in my hot studio, I have something called glazing liquid. This is this product right here, and what this does is slow down the drying of my paint and allows me to blend and work in thin glazes easier. I have a 16 by 20 canvas. I buy these in multi-packs very economically. I'm going to be using brushes with synthetic fibers for acrylic paint. Let's just get started building the world our chickadee lives in. I'm going to pull out a number 12 bright. This has got a square kind of shape to it and a nice sharp edge and the bristles aren't very long. I'm going to get the brush wet and I'm going to come take just a smidge. You can almost see it's just so very little. Look how little yellow is on there. Just the tip of the brush over to my titanium white. I don't want too much. If I get too much, it could make everything that comes after a little bit green. And if you'll notice, if you imagine your canvas divided into fours, I'm going to come up in my upper right and start making kind of circular brush strokes going out. There's very little yellow pigment on my brush and this is going to keep everything from going green on me later because as I add in blue we all remember what um, yellow and blue make. It makes green. I'm still pulling in a little of my glazing medium and my titanium white but again remember you don't have to have glazing medium to paint I have to have it to paint because I have to have so many lights in my studio so the camera can see me that it's very hot and dry. But if you're in normal conditions or not near an air conditioner or something that can dry out your paint quickly, you wouldn't need that. It's just a nice thing to have if you need the help. I'm going to start taking a small amount of my ultramarine blue. You can see how little is on the brush here and bringing it over to my titanium white maybe a little more than what I grabbed and right here on the edge create a nice halo or blend between these two colors. My brush pressure is light. I'm working just the tip of my bristles. You can see here the paint is not like very integrated and it's not very far up the filaments. I'm going to go over and get some more. I'm going to pull out just a little more ultramarine. You'll notice I'm not mixing these two just directly together. I'm doing it in stages. So I have control over how dark the paint is. I'm going to pull out a little more glazing liquid here just to help me out. And if you have it, that's how you would do that. You can see how I've loaded it on my brush. It's mostly on this side because that's you know going to be the heavier direction that I'm I'm working but I can go back and forth because of the flexibility of my bristles. You'll notice by adding more blue pigment I'm darkening the circle as I work it out and that's what creates this wonderful halo effect that shows us where our sunlight is later for when we add our apple 
tree branch and our chickadee. Pulling out quite a lot more from what I was doing before. I'm even putting on both sides of the brush. This ultramarine, I'm gonna come over to my titanium white. Just enjoying that. And continuing this circle going out. Just continuing the circle as it goes out. Quite a lot of fun we're having. Just enjoying my sky. This is the sky that you see in fall that's slightly cool and the wind is crisp. And just a smidge of water, just barely dampening my brush. Sometimes it's called warming up your brush. Mix a little white into it. You can see how it is. We've got glazing, we've got the color. You can see on the canvas that it's a little bit darker. That's what's nice about this ultramarine is it has that clear but very clearly fall atmosphere to it. Colors make us think of things like temperature. So a lot of times when we talk about color in art, we'll say a color is cool or warm. Obviously they don't have an actual warmth or coolness to them, but what it is is that our minds think of those temperatures. It's the illusion that's created. Pulling out a little more blue. You notice I didn't add any white. Just letting the white that's on my brush be there. And I'm making sure that I'm creating a nice sky effect. And having this lightness to ever increasing dark graduate around. One nice thing that the glazing medium does give me, especially from this one product, is it gives me time to blend my paint, which in my studio is very nice, and it might be nice for you. See, I'm pulling it more and more, maybe just a smidge of white into that. I don't want it to be its darkest blue quite yet. You can see how much paint I put on both sides, pulling out, pulling out a little of my glazing medium. I don't really even mix it in. My brush, the filaments that are on it are very stiff and firm, and that helps it really push the paint into the canvas. If you're having trouble getting the paint to cover the canvas, don't feel like it's you, because it might not be. It may be your paint or your brush. Doesn't mean you can't work it out. It's just important not to panic and realize that you're fine, you're doing a good job. Getting my brush a little bit wet here. Because the paint on it will want to dry sometimes. You can see I pulled out a lot more blue, but I'm gonna add a smidge. Because again, I don't want it to be full strength. Pulling out the glazing. You can see how that all sort of looks on my brush. And just adding that to the canvas and blending. And you can see that creates some wonderful energy and what we like to call atmosphere. It's not a challenging technique, but if you've never done it before, be very forgiving of yourself if, you know, it doesn't work perfectly, perfectly the first time. The first time I tried to ride a bike, it didn't work out perfectly. Second time, not as much. It took a few tries. And painting is like that. It can take a few tries to get it perfect. But the wonderful thing about art, it's not about being perfect, it's about being creative. You know, there's a lot of jobs where you have to really, really be perfect. If you were an astronaut, 
well, there's a lot more pressure on you <laughs> to be perfect in that job, right? And less pressure <laughs> maybe to be creative. I just think of that because we have, you know, astronauts where I live and they have such a precision job. And I've enjoyed that tour and thought to myself, wow, how different our jobs are. But you could still see people uh, being really creative, being funny and creative. I'm pulling out my blue. I just wanted to smidge a little white into that and I'm pulling out some more glazing liquid. I'm just brushing this on. Acrylic paint can take a couple coats to look right because sometimes it's what's called transparent. In other words, it's not very opaque. Almost all of the modern synthetic colorants that are made today are actually technically transparent, but their color is so powerful that they will seem opaque. It's very interesting to learn about how paint is made. It's an interesting job to have. There's a lot of interesting jobs out there. I enjoy learning about what other people do. I'm just continuing to pull now just the ultramarine, aren't I? And I'm putting it working it out, just following my brush stroke. You can see I'm curving it in sort of the semi-circle. I might need to put a, a little bit out. I use a lot of the ultramarine blue for this painting. So, that can happen. Pull out a little more into my brush. You can see how I'm, the paint is creeping up, isn't it? I'll have to do a, a good rinse here in a second to stop that. If the paint gets up into your ferrule, it's okay, you can wash it out. But that's probably the most damaging thing that happens in the course of using your brush. And you've got to really wash it out when you're done, or it will shorten the life of your brushes. This is one of the ways that acrylic paint is very different than other paint mediums. It's very damaging to its brushes. But with good care, they can last a long, long time. So now I have a fairly dramatic sky that I like very, very much. It's a lot of fun right there. And I'm gonna rinse that brush out like we talked about. Rinse, 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 rinse. Like you do, it's nice to get the pigment all out. If you'd like to know more about this painting or anything that we talked about today, you can check out theartsherpa.com for more information. I'm gonna take my hair dryer and I'm gonna give this a good dry so that when I do the next part, the paint is dry and takes the next layer easily. Now that my painting's dry, I'm gonna pick another bright brush and I'm gonna start painting in my branch. I always like picking brushes and imagining how that tool will help me. I'm gonna grab a number six bright. This is a number six bright. I'm gonna get it a little wet and I'm gonna do an interesting thing that might surprise you. A lot of people when they paint this, they might wanna do it first with black, but we're actually not gonna do that. We're going to take a little of our ultramarine blue over to our burnt sienna and I'm mixing almost a one to one here very carefully. Not mixing both together because I want to save my brown and save my paint and one good way to save money on paint is to have good palette habits. So I pulled this out. You'll notice it's almost the exact same color as the bristles on my brush and I'm going to come up here. And I'm going to imagine a tree off my canvas and I'm just learning about this branch. I'm just seeing this branch. And so this branch is coming from the tree and it's a little benty. So I'm going to make sure I'm getting a little, I'm pulling out a little more more paint so I'm not having to work too hard for my color. The blue and the brown make a very, not black, but it's a very deep kind of grade color. It feels very wood-like and I like it. So the first thing is I'm gonna make sort of the line or shape of my branch. It winds up, makes a little knot, and then it starts to come down. When you're trying to understand how to paint something, it can help. I'm gonna dip in water a little bit. 
just to increase the flow of my paint. So you don't always have to use glazing liquid because acrylic paint can be thinned with water. It was made for that. So if you don't have it, see how well that works. I'm gonna make a little dip here until this sort of like little up, oh, it's growing up. When you think about trees and what they do and how they grow, you know, they go through all this weather and seasons and the different places the sun is in the sky. It doesn't make straight lines. It makes kind of crazy, interesting lines. And you want to make sure that your tree has that feeling, maybe. I'm not going to do the whole trunk, the whole branch here, because I'm going to have to switch to a smaller brush. For sure, for sure. And I'm going to come sort of fill out this branch. So the trick with branches is I'm going to come over maybe two inches and make a little dash there so I know where I'm starting. It's about being parallel but then also converging. So you're following this line but you're going to want to be ever tapering your branch down. So I'm following up. I want to follow that line but I also want to taper my branch down. I want it to feel like it has seen cold weather and hot weather and droughts that it is an old tree and therefore has character and then I can paint that entire branch in I have just pulled a little ultramarine over to my burnt sienna you can see me mixing it around one trick I can do is I can press this off my brush and then reload the tip see how I scraped it and reloaded the tip that really helps me I'm just going to paint this all in between these two lines with this brown paint, this dark brown paint that I mixed. I've just pulled out more burnt sienna. I keep mixing that same color again with the ultramarine blue and the burnt sienna. I haven't changed paints yet. I'm putting the first layer of my branch in. first layer of my branch. Really like it. It's quite dark. It's still distinctly kind of brown, which is helpful when we're trying to tell the story of wood, or at least this type of wood. Pulling out a little more ultramarine blue over to my burnt sienna, making more of that color. I'm going to create a little kind of downward branch story on this old ancient apple tree. So I imagine that a long time ago this little branch came off, started to grow its own way, and discover its own space in the sun. Make a little elbow there and turning down. It's about really being in the tree mindset. Now what it's been through I'm coming back and I'm thickening the line to where it joins this branch here. This branch will be skinnier than this branch. Now once I have those laid in, I'm going to get a smaller brush that I have a lot of control over. It's a little bit smaller, but it's enough to give me a nice fine line. This is a number two bright. Get it wet to warm it up and pull out some of my burnt sienna and my ultramarine blue to mix up more of this deep, darkest part of the branch color. I'm going to come here at the second branch I did and create a little twiglet for a leaf to live on. I press harder here and then lighten, lighten, lighten up. That's how I thin my line. And then I'm going to make a little Y. Pressing harder here, you can see it pressed into the canvas and then lightening up to tell that part of the story. And then two little lines off there for leaves. Back over to here, pulling more paint onto the brush. You can see I've loaded it up. And I'm gonna say this sort of breaks down here. Oh, there's the little stem that might be in the apple. Here's one of the leaves. And here's another little leaf coming over for a twig. How nicely did that work? 
you know, I might even take a little broken little branch right here, because that happens, sometimes they break. Tell that story, invest in that story. While I've got this detail brush, I'll pull a little of my ultramarine blue over, swirl it in, swirl in a little of my burnt sand, you can see me swirling it around, trying to get that general mix. And I'm gonna paint in my leaf shape. Now, most of us are familiar with the leaf shape. We think of like a football, but in this shape, we're gonna actually paint the leaf. So it's gonna curve up, come down, curve up, and come to what will be the tip. Then I'm gonna bring a little curved line. It's a reverse curve here. Many, many what I like to call compound curves. It's gonna go up and then down and curl back into that tip. And that has, allows me later when I paint my leaf to tell the story of how it's dried in this weather, how this weather has impacted it and the lack of water. And everything that's happening to it. And I'm making sure that this first layer of paint is right there. I'm gonna paint in my second leaf and some of it might disappear into my apple. I might paint some of my apple over it, but I just want it to be here first. I like to layer. I often get asked, if you knew you were going to paint over it, why did you paint it in? Because of the beautiful way the objects then lay over each other. That helps it feel more real. It's not the only way you can do it. There's a lot of ways to paint. There's a lot of ways to do this and you don't ever wanna try to get rigid in your thinking and think there's just one way. Because then that limits your opportunity for adventure and you deserve adventure. That's why you started painting probably in the first place. I'm gonna put another little leaf right here. I don't know what you guys think about it. I'm gonna put it out there, flare out two lines for this leaf. But I still want it to feel dry like it's been under the distress of maybe I break it there, kind of like a little drought. So I really like to vary that line up. And listen, if drawing is not your comfort space, I think it's okay to trace on your design. That's okay, it's not cheating. Sometimes people will tell you it's cheating, but it's not. That's not how that works. Drawing is just an art skill. That's all. One of many, many, many art skills that you can choose to develop over time. But your creative practice, how you choose to express yourself, that's personal. That belongs to you. I'm taking some more burnt sienna out, swirling it around, and some ultramarine blue and swirling it around. I'm going to wipe my brush off because you can see it's coming right up into the ferrule. So I may even come over to my towel and wipe that off. Load the brush to the tip and paint another little very character leaf down here. Yeah, your art practice is personal. This is time that belongs to you and in your art practice you get to be right, you get to be creative, you get to really honor all the different parts of yourself and you don't have to answer to other people. And that's quite nice sometimes. You can hear yourself. Just keep painting that in. Just keep painting that in. Now to help me tell the difference between these two leaves, you'll notice I'm just pulling out a little burnt sienna, but I'm not adding as much of the blue to it. So it's just a slightly different color than the leaf in front of it. And I might tuck this, tuck this leaf out. Curl, okay, curl that back. And just color all this in with your paint. That is very fun. You can rinse your brush off. Now one of the fun things I like to do is to take a little of my ultramarine, not a whole lot, over to my cad red. And when I mix them together, I get almost a brick color, a deep brick color. And I want this to be the darkest part of my apple 
the shadow. So I gotta find the right darkness shade for that. And here we go. I think I've got it. You can see the paint's worked up my brush, so I'll wipe it off. And load just the edge here. See, just the edge is loaded. Now we're gonna do a really easy thing. We're gonna just draw a circle. Don't worry about your apple circle being perfect. I'm gonna put this back in my water and pull out a slightly larger brush to paint in my apple. Apples are not perfect spheres. They're grown in the wild, out in nature. And there's a lot of differences from one apple to another. So never ever feel bad that your apple isn't a perfect circle. And if circles really frustrate you, go ahead and trace a circle. So see how I'm pulling a little of my ultramarine blue out like this, taking it over to my cad red and making this deep brick color. It's slightly different than the branch and it will make a big difference when we paint this apple in later. Just keep pulling out the paint. We just need to cover the canvas with this red. That's all we need to do. It's so fun. Just paint it all in. You can try to curve your brush strokes like I'm doing to imply the shape of our apple, but at this stage, it's not that important. And you may need to come back pulling a little of the blue out but my brush is still dirty and putting a little center right here. Just one that has a slight shadow to it, doesn't it? Just start telling that because we want to show where that is. I'm just pulling out the blue, but I haven't rinsed my brush. And I'm just creating a shadow. I can even go back to my brown, pulling in a little more blue, make my dark branch color, and enforce this twig that goes into the apple. Now I've created some space. I'm going to rinse out my brush a little bit. I'm going to pick up another bright that I'm really fond of and I feel gives me a lot of control. This is my number four bright. It has a nice short synthetic filament. And I'm going to take my yellow ochre over to my titanium white and I'm going to do the first layer of who will be my little bird later. And he's going to be right here. This is where he's resting and I'm going to make sure that he's a he's a little bit rounded. So first I kind of draw this slightly squished circle. Just a slightly squished circle. almost tucked right up to that branch and I'm gonna pull out I haven't rinsed my brush off yet it's very interesting what you do for the head you're just gonna make a little bump right here in the center that might be hard for you to see but you can look at the finished painting to get a sense and I'll look at my finished painting to get a sense of how that is because it's not perfectly lined up. It's not quite like a snowman. It's like a little bump. So let's go ahead and add the extra texture and drama and highlights and lowlights that are going to bring this painting together. And remember, paintings always look weird in the middle. My painting looks weird in the middle. Your painting might look weird in the middle. And it's about sticking through and hanging in. It gets us to a completed painting. I'm going to pick another brush as I like to do. I like to dig through my brushes and see who volunteers. And I feel like this number four bright volunteered. So I'm gonna pull this out. I'm gonna start creating some of the different drama that might go on my branch. So the first thing I'm gonna do is pull out a little bit of this ultramarine blue that I have left. And I'm gonna mix it into the brown. But now what I'm gonna do is allow just a little more of the brown to show through. And I'm going to add, see this, just with the corner of my brush, a smidge of white. 
pulling that in there. And I'm like even going flip and mixing, flip and mixing a little of my gel because the studio is hot. And then I'm going to come on the corner of my brush here and start just adding some random dashes, dashing, dashing, dashing to create this first sense of bark that I might have. I'm keeping this dark area here as it is right now and trying to make sure that these highlight dashes that I'm adding are very broken up and don't make a really recognizable pattern. And what I would mean by that is like as if they went like that would make an implied line and it would really catch my eye. And sometimes in nature things try to not catch your eye and they do that by breaking up their pattern. So we can do that here. I really like imagining that the sun is shining on the branch so it's catching it, catching little highlights. As you paint down you might notice that the brush you've chosen is too big for the job and whenever you get there always feel like you can change it out for a smaller brush. That's always fine to do. I'm going to bring some of these dashes here. I added a little water to my paint because it wasn't flowing off my brush very nicely. I could have used my liquid glazing medium or a lot of other objects. I'm going to wipe my brush but not rinse it. Pull out just a little more of my burnt. Grab the rest of this blue. Mix that in there. I don't want it as dark as last time but I want it darker. I'm going to just add these little dashes to the branch, weaving the lighter color and darker color together. Paying attention to where I think that there might be a shadow, like where this branch is curving, and about giving this branch a definitive texture I can really see and feel. Come down here a little bit as well. And on the other side, I might need to switch to a smaller brush for the smaller bits of this. So I'm going to look for a nice number two that I used earlier. Pulling out my brown and a little of my blue to one side. Go ahead and add white again, creating that little highlight. Now I'm going to come where I couldn't put that color earlier on top of these delicate little branches. My pressure is very light. It can be challenging to create thin lines. Thin lines are usually made by using less pressure. Let me come down my little branch here and my little stems even because that's helpful to me. Then I'll get the darker color I mixed up earlier. If you need to add a little more blue to it, go ahead and do that. And I'm going to add some of these little textural dashes into my branches just to show the many values right, that a branch can have. Interestingly enough, I'm going to come over, not rinsing my brush, isn't that crazy? I'm just letting all this wonderful color be on it. This is a bit like when you're cooking and you're scraping the bits at the bottom of a pan. I'm going to add a little white to this mix and this is going to help me create a highlight. I'm going to come right here and where I think that the sun would be hitting this branch a little bit harder I'm going to add some of those dashes 
I'm going to pick a little up. Come right here. I'm going to be hitting it quite hard right here. This helps give my branch some shape and definition. I'm using my glazing medium there because I'm having some flow problems. It's very, very dry and hot in my studio. If you were painting near an air conditioner, that could really impact you and dry out your paint very quickly. Just adding a little bit. I'm going to come here along this little stem and down this one. I'm pressing very lightly so I get a thin line. Continuing to add some drama right next to our, our little chickadee, our cheerful chickadee. Into the stem, into there, and into there. I may need to put out a little more ultramarine blue. Pull some out with your brown. If you need to go back and dark, add your dark color back, I'm just going to show you real quick. What happens if you put in too much highlight? You just come back with another color and paint it out. I get asked that a lot. What happens if I do too much? This is acrylic paint. Once it dries, you can change your mind. You can alter what you did. Just try to dash around and make sure that the piece has lots of value changes. Lots of little value changes. That's what makes a painting. Little dark shadows here and there. Come over and even add a couple here. The bottom here. Not nice? Lots of definition. Lots of definition. Now I can start creating some of the color in my apple and my leaves. And first I'm gonna do my leaves. I'm gonna pull out a little of my yellow ochre. And I'm going to paint just what we like to call a dry brush right on this leaf. Just that next color. You can leave some of the shadow here if you feel like it will help. All right. So one thing that you can do is you get a little white on your brush. You haven't rinsed it out. Come and put a little highlight on this leaf right over the top. See that highlight? Don't put it everywhere. Put a little bit corner there. And then maybe another little corner right here at the edge of this leaf. Don't take it all the way across. Just take it down a little bit. Then you can even put a little bit here and it starts to make the leaf feel like it's bent. I'm going to wipe my brush off, but not actually even really rinse it. And pull out a little of my burnt sienna smidge of my ultramarine blue. Come and paint my first leaf. And a little more. My brush has still got pigment from the previous leaf. And that actually makes me work a lot less when I'm painting, allowing that to move along. Then this time you can get some just ochre. Come and put a highlight right there on this leaf maybe along this half of the leaf. That looks pretty nice. Now I'm going to get a lot more blue. Let that all mix in and you're going to see it goes really gray. I haven't rinsed it. I just grabbed a little blue, brought it over here and let it mix in with what was on my brush. You might add a little white to it. A little Glazy medium for me because my brushes dry from the hot conditions of the studio. But your conditions might be perfect, so you wouldn't have to worry about that. I'm just painting that in. I'm totally letting the paint underneath the leaf show through. I'm going to wipe my little leaf, but not rinse my brush. I'm going to put a little highlight going to draw a little line down the center and just let this be right here. See how that makes those leaves feel dry? Like the tree is only sending all of what it has, pulling this highlight here. You can even put a little of that highlight over here. It's a fun thing that you can do. Let's put in these leaves. 
Don't rinse your brush. Grab a little brown. And let's come do the same thing on this one. I rinsed it. I've wiped it off. Just grab my brown. But everything that's on my brush is still there. That's something that can make you nervous when you're new to painting, but it's actually helpful. Not rinsed. Grabbing some yellow ochre, just like this. Don't be worried about it. You can come down the center. Maybe paint this side with a little bit of that yellow ochre. It's okay, it's very painterly is what we like to call it. Now let's grab some burnt, still not rinsed. Come around this side of the apple. Look at that, isn't that wonderful? Now go ahead and indulge in rinsing, rinsing your brush. We're gonna start painting in this wonderful apple. So the apple is really fun. I'm gonna pull out a little of my cad red and a smidge of my ultramarine, not as much as before. And I'm gonna start dry brushing. And if you'll notice that my brush is just very lightly on the canvas and my brush strokes are curving with my apple and layering in this next tone or color of paint. Apples have a lot of color. They're very interesting. Think how many varieties are at the grocery store. I'm bringing the paint around to make sure that this feels like a round object. But I'm not painting on all the dark paint I had underneath. And without rinsing my brush, I'm bringing a little of my yellow ochre over to my red. I'm going to add just at the top, pulling down a little of this color. But I'm curving. See, I'm curving the brush stroke to imply the shape of the apple. So it's not just that I've added this mixture of ochre and cad. Here I go again. Brush isn't rinsed. Ochre and cad. And I just pull that down. Just breathe. Wipe your brush, but don't rinse. And even you can grab a little of your cad yellow and mix in a little of your cad red up here in the apple. Pull down a little of this yellow because sometimes apples have yellow in them, don't they? Red apples will have bits of yellow. And that's what you want to do is you want to show all of the personality that you might see. I'm doing what's called like a scrumble where I'm sort of pushing the paint in, but my brush is very dry. Like that there, it gives it a lot of personality. Grab a little white. I haven't rinsed my brush. Get a little more yellow. There we go. Just add a little of that soft highlight. A couple places of where it's slightly lighter. Paying attention to the curve of my stroke. Let me get some just cad now. Come on the outside edge on my edge of my brush. Outside edge on the edge of my brush. Just right here at the girth of the apple, brushing in the red. Not feel like very real, very colorful, very fall. I'm still leaving some of this dark color at the bottom because this apple has shape, it has shade. Now I'm gonna rinse, rinse my brush out. And interestingly enough, I'm going to take a little of my gray mixture that I had over here and pull it out and just make an off-white. I don't want it to be bright white. Just an off-white. And around the top of my apple, I'm going to pull a little highlight reflection. Just a little bit. Just a small amount. You can see it's just very dry. And then maybe a little bit right here. Just to show that this is round. Just a little.
Now we'll try to paint in the chickadee. And the chickadee is a lot of fun. So we've painted in the yellow ochre and white, but we're gonna come back with just a little more yellow ochre on the brush. And around the little chickadee's belly, we're gonna come with this two inch bright, not two inch, this is a number two bright. And I'm just gonna fluff, fluff, fluff this little belly. Fluff right here on the outside edges. I allow these little strokes to kind of not be perfect because he's, he's ruffling his feathers, right? To make himself seem more fluffy. And I'm gonna make sure that I've got a little bit up here in what will be the cheeks. The top where his shoulders meet his little head. You can kind of see where that's sketched in. You can see that a little bit. It's not perfect, it's just a little tone. We're gonna keep building on it. You can dust a little bit through him. Wipe your brush off. And interestingly enough, you're gonna get some black paint. Just using my gel, because everything, you can see this is called skinning and that's when your paint gets dry too quickly. And I'm gonna come here between, at, almost at his shoulders, and make a little dash of the first little markings of his little black markings, this little chickadee. This is a happy chickadee. He loves that he found this happy little branch. I'm gonna fluff out these feathers. I'm doing that by planning and pulling. It's sort of like a little eyelash flick. But you know that the wind is blowing. You may even wanna put a couple out like that. It's gonna take a couple layers of the black paint to really capture him. So don't be too picky with yourself at first. Just keep fluffing up his little feathers. Little flicks, little fluffers. He's fluffy. Every time you paint a chickadee, you're gonna feel a little different. And these guys have such big personalities, you cannot imagine so many big personalities for little tiny birds. And remember, this is the first coat of black, so it's not perfect yet. You'll be adjusting. You'll be adjusting. All right. Got that there. I'm gonna rinse out my brush pretty well. So I don't have any black pigment on it. I'm gonna come get, this is still with the number two bright. I'm gonna get the white. I'm gonna come here and I'm going to add his little white feathers. And I'm gonna be doing that same wonderful fluffy stroke. You know, know that your chickadee might be a little different than my chickadee. Be more serious, might be more silly. It's your little bird on a branch. And just not making neat rows. I'm breaking up the pattern. I'm not cloning what I'm doing. I want to show that the air is blowing. That a blustery little day for fluffy little chickadees. It's a blustery little day. You can use the painting, the finished painting for reference. You might need to wipe off your brush, pull a little bit on. You can see the load is just again on the tip. Just making sure, I don't want to paint out all my low lights. Some of this is what makes him feel fluffy. Time to put in that second coat of black I've rinsed off. 
I'm pulling out some black on the tip of my brush. It's on a little bead. On the tip of my brush, on a little bead. In the center of his face, I want it more solid black. But it's okay that on the outer edges of him, it's sort of fluffy and goes out. And then like where the two little feather color areas join. That's okay too. You can even say, oh, little, little chickadee fluff went down that way. How fluffy is this chickadee? Pretty fluffy. He lives by a house that has bird feet. So he's just a very happy chickadee. There you go. See how it's just, you can feel the wind. Now I'm going to make sure, so when I go to paint in his eyes, make sure that these come down just a little bit to give me space for that. His little markings. And I may have to adjust a couple of times. For sure, I'm going to have to switch to a tiny detail brush. And I'm going to be looking at my different tiny detail brushes. And I'm going to decide to use this smaller brush. This is a 10 over 0 brush. And these are often used for miniature painting. And I find them super useful in my studio. So I'm going to pull out a little brown. I even mix a little black into it, but I want just a small brown tint. Grab some white, just a gray. You can see this mixture there, and then I'm rolling the brush and pulling it out, and just scraping to get a little bit on this outer tip. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to make a very light little upward little triangle in his little beak. And then it's going to come down to a little point. Then I'm going to make the circles for his little eyes. And they're going to be really light and really delicate. I'm going to set one right here. It may be hard for you to see against the dark on dark, but these subtle things are a big deal when you're right next to them. So I put my little beak here and my two little eyes to either side of that. You know, and you need to decide, are these too high? Do you need to make them lower? And if you do, make adjustments. I'm going to make an adjustment because I want them to be a little bit lower. That's an important part of doing your art is being like, is that what I want? And if it isn't, then make an adjustment. In your life, make an adjustment. So, okay, I just want the eyes to be a little above the beak, but not as far above the beak, which is why I changed my mind. So I just want you to know changing your mind is okay. I'm pulling out a little bit on the thing here. I'm going to give it a second go. It's time. Slightly lower. Had to grab a little more white. Couldn't even see what I was doing. These are very small circles that you're painting in, just so you know, with very fine lines, and they're very faint. It's not a big, noticeable line at first. I've just put a little paint on the tip of my brush here, you know, coming in and saying, oh, right here, maybe a little bit on the inside of the eye, just a little bit more. A little something right there around the beak. I'm drawing a line right down the center. If you need to go back with your black paint and fix your eye, you can. There's a lot of little adjustments at this stage, and be okay with that. While you're here with your detail brush, you can load a little black paint on it. So I've got it loaded just right at the edge. And I'm going to make a little foot that goes down. It's just three, two little, three little lines, two little lines. Just these little lines of this little foot that is holding on 
to my branch. It's very faint. They have teeny tiny little feet. I mean, if you want to give them a big foot, you can. Or her. Could be a her. It's your chickadee. Now I'm going to get a little of my yellow ochre. And I'm going to put just a smidge of black to kind of knock it back so it's not super bright. And I'm going to come on this side with just the lightest little highlight of that yellow. So just a little bit, mixing the black into the yellow. Take a little of that color even, put around the eyes, but it's very light. Now, rinse, rinse, rinse. Get some just white on your brush. It's on the tip, I hope you can see this. My hands are covered in paint, but that's being an artist. People will start to guess what you're up to. I'm gonna create a little dot and another little dot little tiny dot, another little dot, and that makes a reflection on our little chickadee's eyes. You can even take a very fine light line right on the little feet, and that creates a wonderful highlight. Just a little bit, maybe even on the top of the feet there. Just show him what that is. And then when you're all done, last thing, you just give it a signature. Just give it a signature, if you want. How's that for fall? Little chickadee on a branch. I think that makes me feel pretty good. I hope that makes you feel pretty good. I hope you gave yourself some time to be creative and enjoy your own company. It's really wonderful to get to a place where you like just being inside your own head and painting can help you do that. I hope you're gonna keep being creative, that you're good to each other, that you know you deserve to be happy and I wanna see you at the easel really soon.